Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session. We are now in um, week two of the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And the topic for today is fight the fish. We have seen um, a rise in phishing attacks and scams since the COVID-19 pandemic began. And phishing attacks actually account for more than 80% of reported security incidences. So today we shall be talking about the importance of um, being wary of emails, text messages, uh, messages that come from strangers or from someone that you are not expecting. So without further ado, I will, uh, we have two speakers today and Anthony will be taking us through um, who Think Cyber is. They are our partner and our, the sponsor for today's session. And thereafter we'll have Malusi taking us through the rest of the session. Tony, you have the floor, Karibu sana. Tony, are you Hello. Hello, Tony. We can hear you. Okay, brilliant. So let me just share my screen. Just a moment, I think I'm unable to share my screen.
as we are sorting that out, um, as Tony figures out the technical issues, um, I just wanted to let you know that there will be polls and a survey at the end of this session. And feel free to, if you have any questions during the session, please um, put them in the chat box and somebody, including the trainer, will be able to get back to you in the course of the session. So if there are any questions, if there are anyone, is if there's anyone who needs to join, please let them know that this is where we are at. We are also on YouTube. You can get this session there. It's being recorded and will be on YouTube for a uh, future reference. Hello, hello, Shay. Hi, Tony. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'm having issues sharing my screen, so uh, I hope you guys can see my Lucy's uh, screen. Not yet, in a bit. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'll be using uh, a screen to go through introduction on uh, Think Cyber Africa. So, sorry about that, guys. So, as an introduction, my name is Anthony Mutiga. I am a cybersecurity researcher and trainer at Think Cyber Africa. So, Think Cyber Africa, I'll take you through an introduction of what you offer. So, next slide. is a subsidiary of uh, Think Cyber, which is an Israeli company. And uh, in our team, we have uh, cybersecurity professionals in different uh, different expertise and knowledge. Uh, we have different, uh, different uh, professionals with different uh, expertise and experience in different uh, cybersecurity fields. And uh, we offer, we mostly offer training and uh, we'll show you the courses we offer in a moment.
So, uh, just a moment as the slides will reflect shortly. So the courses we offer, we offer uh, network research training. We also offer penetration testing and you also offer Windows for it. Uh, our training, we aim to address the cyber challenges experienced on the network level. And so it will cover various network attack techniques and how to defend them. And uh, hopefully by the end of the, the training, the participants will be able to build and maintain a secure network, protect data on their network, manage vulnerabilities, uh, implement active access control measures, and uh, monitor the, the network for any inconsistencies. Then under penetration testing, penetration testing, this, uh, this training is, uh, we offer a, an in-depth course focusing on the practice of uh, scale penetration testers. And then uh, the, the knowledge is very broad because there are very many aspects in penetration testing. And then this mostly is to find the weaknesses in an organization and uh, how to secure it, your organization uh, by equipping, equipping uh, your employees or your IT team with penetration testing assessments and helping them to better test your network. And Windows Forensics, this is a very essential Windows OS. And so the, the participants will learn how different computer components work, how they can investigate after a cyber incident, and uh, they develop, they develop hands-on capabilities as you go. So next slide, please. So our target market, our target market for for our training as Think Cyber, we can train beginners. We can also train uh, cyber security enthusiasts or the technical experts in the field because our trainings range from beginner to advanced, and so we usually take them through real-world hacking challenges. And uh, it's a very hands-on training experience. And also, if uh, for, the, for the training, for the training, for the training, we also have, uh, we let them gain uh, relevant learning experiences that will propel them towards a career in cyber security. Next slide. So our partners, we, these are people we work closely with. We have Ikral Innovation Hub and Think Cyber, the Israeli company. We are a subsidiary of them in Africa. Next. So any questions so far before I introduce our, our speaker and my colleague? Okay, so next slide. In case of any inquiries, the, uh, there's an email. Okay, I've just seen a question by Trunsky. Yes, the courses are beginner friendly, and uh, because uh, we have very we have various uh, various uh, courses at the moment, so we have an introduction introduction to Linux for guys who have never interacted with Linux before, and then after the introduction to Linux, then the, it can take them to a beginner-friendly uh, Windows forensic uh, course or uh, penetration testing. You can start with uh, 
they can start the introduction to Linux and then they can now go to a beginner friendly, either a Windows forensic, a network penetration test, a Windows uh, interpretation testing or a network research uh, course. So, yeah, so for the inquiries, uh, that's the email, thinkcyberafrica at ikral.com and our website is thinkcyberafrica.com. Uh, I've seen a question by Festus. Do you offer any professional certification training? Yeah, yes. Uh, our certifications, uh, certifications are, uh, our certifications are very valuable. Do you mean do you mean uh, do you mean a certificate of the training? So if there are no further questions, um, I would like to, Tony, could you please introduce um, our trainer for today's session? Tony, are you there? Malusi, are you there? Hi, hi, Sue, how are you? Hello, Shay. Hi, Malusi, could you um, tell us who you are and kindly proceed to the rest of the training? Thank you. Yeah, I think Tony got lost there. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, so let me stop sharing so that I can introduce uh myself give me just a minute okay so i think i will start off hello everyone i hope you're having a good um, week. My name is Malusi Mungeli. Um, I'm part of Think Cyber as a trainer together with Tony and several other people. Um, I'm also uh, I'm also an ICRAL Innovation Hub cybersecurity practitioner and researcher and trainer. So I train with both ICRAL as well as Think Cyber. So in this session, I'll be taking you through fight the fish. So we're going to talk about what the fish is as well as its context in the Cyber Awareness Week of this month, which is the Cyber Awareness Month. Um, okay, so I think this is a good point to begin the session. So this is what the session is essentially going to cover. One, we're going to start with existing threats that exist in the cyberspace that we exist as is. Secondly, we're going to look at an introduction on phishing because that is what the focus of this session is about. Then we're going to learn how to spot phishing emails, after which we're going to learn how to mitigate or prevent phishing attacks. Then in case you have been phished, in case you have been tricked into clicking a malicious URL or downloading an attachment, what do you do? So that is what we're going to cover in the fifth section of this presentation. And then finally, we're going to have an activity 
and we're going to conclude the session. So as of now, we have about 40 minutes. So I think that's a good time for us to um, go through the session and hopefully you will learn something or we can share some knowledge throughout this session. Um, if you have any questions during the entire session, you feel free to ask them in the chat. It's open. You can ask, I'll take you through. If you have any question, I'll take you through it. Uh, of course, the slides will be shared. Um, yes, so let's start. Okay, so existing threats. So as we know now, especially now in the context of coronavirus and how we will have been affected by it, the world has become a global village. Um, we all work online, we all shop online, we all bank online. Most of our friends are on social media, so we communicate a lot online. And even education, we learn a lot online. Uh, courses are online. Look at us, we are now online communicating with each other and learning from each other. So as is, we spend a lot of our time online. So during that time, how certain are we that our information is safe? Or how certain are we that whatever we are sharing with other people is not intercepted and people can read what we are saying across the internet? So there are many cyber attacks or cyber threats that exist. But in this session, we're just going to talk about the major attacks that affect networks and our affect, affect our devices. So the first one is malware. And I'm sure most of us have heard about malware before. But just to reiterate, malware is, um, is a combination of two words, malicious software. So it's a collective name of a number of um, malicious software, such as viruses, ransomware, adware, spyware. So malware typically consists of a code that has been developed by attackers, which is designed to cause extensive damage sometimes, sometimes also access to uh, systems where attackers are not authorized to access that information. Secondly, we have phishing, which is going to be the focus of our discussion today. So phishing is a social engineering attack where a cyber attacker tricks you into doing something or clicking a link or downloading an attachment via email. So there are many types of phishing, depending on who is uh, the target audience. Then we have DDoS, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service, which is essentially um, an attack or an attempt to make a service such as a web service or a mail service unavailable by overwhelming it with a, a lot of traffic from multiple sources. Usually the sources are botnets, so that's what DDoS is. So it's a very prevalent attack and we're going to see that uh, in the next couple of slides. And finally, a very common attack that exists online is password attacks, which refers to any method that is used to maliciously authenticate into password protected accounts. So I am sure we have heard about data breaches. So data breaches is where uh, user data is exposed to the internet to attackers or to hackers. So this is where um, attackers are able to gain access to a lot of passwords, a lot of user, user emails, uh, user usernames, sorry. And they're able to use combinations to send spam, to get passwords into other services that they may not have had access to, or they're able to guess passwords from those um, passwords that they were able to acquire. So these four are, in my opinion, the major cyber security attacks that exist um, out there. But to be sure, there are many, many, many others. And execution always varies depending on the, on the, on the difficulty or of, of the attack itself. So, so according to data, and when it comes to cyber attacks, phishing happens to be one of the most common attacks. So this is whatever you're seeing on your screen, there are two different um, data data results from data that shows uh, that phishing is a very prevalent attack that is used a lot by attackers. So on your left side, we have uh, an image showing cyber security attacks that affect various networks in the year of 2018. So this is from a report from Herbert Smith Freehills that shows out of all the attacks that happen in networks, 33% happen to be phishing emails. And from the Statista or from the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center, you can see that 
the number of Americans who fell victim to phishing, crying, phishing emails or phishing or smishing, which are different types of phishing, is 241,000, almost 242,000. So this is a very, very large number of people who fell victim to phishing. Even when you compare it to other types of cyber crime, you can see that it's very prevalent. And you can see how expensive it is to lose data through these types of um, attacks. Uh, okay, so even yesterday we saw, I think in the Kenyan cyberspace, we saw that in the cyberspace, um, in the circles, especially in the financial sector, we lose an equivalent of 6.23 million per month or 208,000 daily to cyber crime. And as we're going to see later, a lot of cyber crime begins with phishing email because it's very effective. So this should be a wake up call for all of us to understand how phishing works um, and how to mitigate phishing attacks on our networks and on our persons. Okay. So this is why we will focus a lot on phishing because it's a precursor to many types of attacks. So it's a precursor to ransomware, to network att attacks, data breaches, and so on and so forth. So according to a report by the Cyber Defense Magazine, about 91% of all cyber attacks start from a phishing email. So it's a very, very large number and we should all be concerned about that. About 91% of all cyber attacks start from a phishing email. And this is because I, I believe hackers have understood the human mind and they're able to manipulate users into doing something that otherwise they wouldn't be able to do. So out of, uh, out of uh, the phishing emails that are sent out, they're usually sent out in bulk. On average, 30% of phishing emails are opened by the intended recipient. And 12% of recipients will click on a malicious link or open a malicious attachment. So contextually, let's say we have an organization and this organization has about a hundred people. So if I, send, if I send a phishing campaign to this company, just to try to see who the rates of how people will click and so on and so forth, out of the hundred emails that I sent to all these individuals, 30% of the people will open them. And out of those 30%, 12, 12 individuals will click on that link or open a malicious attachment. So statistically, phishing is the most successful and dangerous of all the cyber attacks. And this is why you can see that 91% of cyber attackers will, will use phishing emails to gain initial access into networks that they shouldn't have access to because they know they're almost always successful. So now that we've seen how successful and effective phishing is, so let's talk a little bit more about phishing. What is phishing? As we mentioned before, phishing is a type of social engineering. And when we talk about social engineering, it involves the human persona. So in this case, the person is the target. So phishing is a type of social engineering where an attacker will send a fraudulent message via an email. So that's via email is phishing, via text is smishing, and via a recorded phone message or phone call, that's phishing. And it is designed to trick a human victim into doing something. We're going to see what motivations attackers have for phishing. So phishing emails are usually sent by criminals in bulk to thousands of randoms of people in the hopes that someone will click or download an attachment. And we've seen from statistics that this is almost guaranteed to, to work. So this constantly keeps happening. Even with all the user awareness training that we have, phishing will always remain a very successful tactic for cyber attackers. So what motivations do attackers have when they are phishing. So there are three primary motivations. The first one is attackers want to harvest or to steal your credentials. So credentials in this case could be, they want to steal your login credentials. That could be a username or a password or an email address. Um, and credential phishing aims at harvesting credentials for online services. So they can try to ask you to sign up for a service or, um, something which can then be maliciously accessed as a direct source of information. So for example, we're going to see a very common um, scenario where an attacker will ask, will show you that there has been unusual um, activity on your email address. So therefore you have to sign in in order to be able to make changes or so on and so forth. 
So in the process of signing in, you're sharing your credentials, you're signing credentials, and the attackers are harvesting them in order to later use those credentials to access either your email address to gain more knowledge or to have a direct source of information, or sometimes they use these credentials as a method of pivoting from one service to another. So for example, an email that pretends to link to a webmail provider. So for example, you will find an email that tells you your Gmail has been compromised. We need you to sign back up or to change your password. So in the process of you changing your password, an attacker is harvesting those credentials and they're going to bank on the hopes that you reuse your credentials, which is something that was talked about in the previous, um, in last week's session. So an email that will pretend to link to a webmail provider will usually link to a cloned page. So it will clone the sign up page where once you enter your credentials, hackers are able to steal usernames and password. So that's the first motivation for attackers to fish, to steal your credentials, to use them later. Secondly, attackers will fish to coerce you to do something. This is not a very common one, but it has very big damages. So this is called action phishing, and they rely on tricking a target into providing information that in of itself is valuable or to take an action which might be valuable. So for example, an email that has been fraudulently sent by a CEO of a company to another employee asking them to send large sums of money offshore would fall into this category. So that's a very common, um, that's a very common action phishing campaign that happens a lot more than you think. The, the last thing is attackers fish to gain access into your device through something we call a shell. So, so this is this usually happens in two ways. So an attacker will ask you to download either malicious attachments. It could be a PDF, it could be a document. They will ask you to just download it and open it. So once you do that, it that document will download uh, malware into your system, which then gives access to attackers through your device. Secondly, uh, attackers can also ask you to click on a link. Once you click the link, the link will remotely download a file that is hosted elsewhere into your device, which will then give um, access to, to, to your attacker. So this, the first stealing of credentials and gaining access are one of the most prevalent attacks that happen with regard to phishing contextually. So moving forward, I think we'll focus on credentials, harvesting, and exploit phishing or shell phishing as uh, our focus points for all of this. So now we've seen the primary motivations for fishermen, I'm gonna call them fishermen, but attackers to, to, to send out phishing campaigns. So any phishing email that you receive almost all, always wants you to either give out your credentials, do something that, that is valuable, or make you download the, an attachment that is gonna give you give the attackers access into your device or into the network. Okay, so once you've clicked on a link or you have downloaded a file, and once you clicked on a link and you're giving out your credentials, there are many things that can happen. Once you've given out your credentials, your identity might be stolen. Someone might masquerade as you somewhere. Credit card fraud might be committed under your name. Um, they can steal sensitive data. For example, if you give out credentials to your email address or your email, yeah, just your inbox, they can steal a lot of, a lot of sensitive information, client information, intellectual property. So there's a lot that can happen in, in the event of a successful phishing attack. So we're going to look at credential phishing. As we mentioned, you can lose your identity, you can lose your money, you can lose... Um, you can, there's, there can be lots of sensitive data, sensitive information. Uh, yeah, you can even lose your reputation, especially if it's a company and data has been stolen from the company. You can, even an authorized transaction might... Uh, hello, is someone who wants to talk? Okay, let me continue. So in with regards to exploit phishing, uh, once an attacker has access into your device, give me a minute until there are any questions. Okay, no questions, let me continue. 
in the events of uh, exploit phishing, successful exploit phishing, where an attacker has gained access into your device, they are easily able to exfiltrate. This data could be intellectual property, could be account information, could be they could install malware throughout your network. They could access um, sensitive systems such as servers. They could even have complete control over your entire network. So this is very dangerous. Phishing, as we, as, as we saw earlier, is the very first step. It's the initial access step into, into very large networks of very sensitive information. So successful phishing attacks are very dangerous, very expensive, and they can cause a lot of damage. So now we've learned about phishing. Sorry. So we've learned about phishing, we've seen how effective it is, and we have seen how it works and what motivations attackers have. So as a user or as a consumer of uh, the internet, how do you support a phishing email? Some of this information might be very common, but we'll just reiterate most of it because I, I'm sure us are aware of how to support a phishing email. So we'll just cruise over this section quite quickly. So you have received an email. So you have seen an email and it's very surprising and you don't know where it has come from and you're not entirely sure whether or not this is a phishing email. The first question you want to ask yourself, is this an unexpected email? Is this an, an email I expected to receive, okay? Most phishing attacks are sent out at random. And even when, when a message appears to come from a company you have an account with, the fact that it's expected should always make, make you question it. So for the first question is, when you see an email, is this message expected? If it's for delivery, you're not expecting a product you didn't buy, a product or a service you didn't buy, a payment you're not owed or a payment confirmation message, for example, or an invoice you don't know anything about, then it's most likely a spam, a spam email. Okay, secondly, do you even know the company or person it's meant to be from? This is a very important question to ask yourself. So even if you do know the company or the person it's meant to be from, is it an, an email you were expecting, okay? So some scammers will take advantage of major news events to make their scams seem genuine. For example, during Corona, a lot of emails appeared to be from the World Health Organization. So that was very expected for a lot of people. Um, in Kenya, for example, during the file tax filing season, if you see a message from Carrie, for example, that might be an expected email. So this is not entirely a way to tell whether the email is a phishing email or not, but it's a way to trigger your mind to think about whether this message is expected or not. The second thing to think about is the email will create a sense of urgency or worry. So to, to persuade users to click on a web link or to open attachments, criminals will always, or we often give the message a sense of urgency, will create worry or simply try to exploit your natural curiosity. So a lot of ways that attackers will try to make uh, emails appear legitimate is if they come from, if they appear to come from a person you might know or you're close with or an authority figure. For example, if you received an email from NHS telling you that your that your account is about to be suspended or from carry or from KPLC that your, that your electricity has an issue, for example. So this creates a sense of urgency you're worried about whether or not your money is safe or you know, the systems that surround you are safe. So that makes you do something, okay? So if, if it creates a sense of urgency or if the message will suggest consequences, for example, if an email claims to claim that there's a security issue on your account and that the account will be closed if you don't do this thing, if you don't download this file or click this link, then you might not, that, that, might, that is creating a sense of urgency or worry for you and prompt you to do an action or make an action that you might not have otherwise. Okay, does it suggest other consequences? Yeah, so if you don't do this thing, you'll be summoned to court or a bank or another account will, a bank account or some other important account will be closed. So the, the sense of consequences or the consequences that come from that sort of uh, 
scenario will trigger you into making an action otherwise you wouldn't have um yeah so criminals will rely on all sorts of human traits or human personality issues to get all of us to fall victim to to their scams or to their tricks so whether that's panic or greed or curiosity even fear of missing out or even just a desire to help other people so attackers will always rely on any of these emotional tags to make you do something and if you feel like they're manipulating you then that's the then it's right for you to be suspicious of, of the message itself so these are examples of um, emails that trigger a sense of urgency or worry so we have um, an unusual signing activity which then prompts you to sign in again or to view recent activity so this might trigger you or might make you click on this link even though you might not be entirely sure what it's about then if you use netflix for example we are sorry to say goodbye implies that you may have made an action that you might not have okay so you might want to click start membership for example and losing your account or the thought that someone has hacked into your account and you know killed your netflix subscription might trigger you to make this action even even when you're not entirely sure that someone has done that so some common ones will include an email confirmation of an order you didn't make and it's giving you a web link to click to cancel it, for example, uh, a court summons, um, or even give you an invoice for, for, for a service or a product, and it triggers your curiosity and you click on it. So these are very common techniques that attackers will use. Second thing, this is one of the biggest and best giveaways for to spot a phishing email. These are web links that don't, don't match the, the website itself. So, for emails, this, this applies to all emails, all of them. So treat all links in all emails as a suspicious link, where a suspicious link is anything that doesn't point to, to a known website. For example, using the image on the screen, you can see that the mouse hovered on the, over the help page. This email appears to have come from amazon.co.uk. This should be the correct domain name for amazon.co.uk. But once the user hovered over the help page, you can see that the domain is different. It's pro21uk.co.uk, not Amazon. So that's a trigger that um, something might be wrong. So links should never point to a random looking address, especially the ones with RU, those are really, really common. The ones that have an extension RU, um, those are really common ones they come from Russia. So watch out also, when it comes to link, also watch out for slight differences that might be trying to fool you. Um, you can have amazon.co.uk or you can have um, Amazon where the O is a zero. So that's a, a very common technique as well. So regarding links as well, be very suspicious of links that are using a short ending service such as Bitly, you know, we all know Bitly or tiny URL. So shortening links um, will always hide the true location of the link itself. So you might want to, we're gonna see how to uh, mitigate this, but you might always want to take that shortened link, use a service that we're going to see a bit later to enlarge it so that you can see the full destination of the link itself. So if the email, let's say the email you have received, for example, Amazon, and you have an account on Amazon, if the email is claiming to come from Amazon, and you're not entirely sure whether it's legit, you can type the correct um, Amazon link rather than clicking on the link itself. Type the correct Amazon link onto your browser rather than clicking on the link itself. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is never click on any link you're not 100% sure about. Fourth, um, the email has an email attachment. We talked about, uh, exploit phishing earlier. So the objective of many malicious emails is to spread malware, often by fooling you to, to download an attachment. Once you download the attachment and open it, it will download malware into your system and give access to, to attackers. When it comes to attachments, first of all, I hope you're sure that the sender is the correct sender or is a legitimate sender. Secondly, uh, look at the extension on the email. 
So um, there's a study by F-Secure that shows that there are 85% chances that malicious email addresses or attachments will have the .doc, .xls, .pdf, .zip, or .7z attachments. So when you see any of these attachments, you might want to think twice about them because they carry inside them malware that can be used to access your, your entire device. So because these are files that users will often open without hesitating, because it's a common file that we all share when communicating online. So additionally, when it comes to attachments as well, you might also want to be cognizant of attachments that look odd, like an SSCDE attachment, for example, or .exe attachment, for example. So those are not attachments that are common, but they are attachments that also um, cannot be filtered or are usually not filtered by it, by your email providers. So when it comes to attachments, always make sure that this is an attachment you expected and it's from a source that you, you can validate. So in a sense, don't open any attachments that you're not expecting to receive. Um, if you know the sender, call them up and send a private or a separate email to verify whether they actually did send the, the initial email. So, Finally, uh, yes, finally, when it comes to basic assessments of emails, um, is the email poorly written? Uh, a lot of cybercrime originates from countries where English is in the primary language or the main language spoken. So, well, many phishing emails are legitimate looking, professional looking. Uh, this isn't always the case. So you might want to look out for poor grammar, um, spelling mistakes, the layout might look bad or poorly formatted. So like using the example on the screen, you can see that there's grammatical error, punctuation errors, there's a punctuation error over here. You can see the sense of urgency. If you do not update, will be closed. So to update your account, just confirm your information. So it only takes a keen eye to see that this is not a legitimate email address. So because of how poorly written, or of course, PayPal will not write an email like this. So that triggers you, you might think about whether or not this could be a phishing scam. So then is a pass, is an email that you received in person? So how has it been addressed? Using an example, you can see dear member. Um, due to the bulk nature of phishing scams or phishing campaigns, uh, many emails are generic and they don't, they're not personal, they don't contain anything personal. For example, if, for example, I bank with KCB and when KCB is sending an email to me, they'll try to attach something that verifies that they have some form of personal information of mine. So they'll send me, for example, the last four digits of my, of my account number to verify that they indeed have my information. When it comes to phishing emails, they usually don't have personal information. So that is something you might want to think about. But this is not almost always true because of data breaches and access to large amounts of um, personal information such as email addresses or passwords, criminals will try to personalize their phishing emails by using data that has been stolen elsewhere. So they might find, let's say, your username, your password, your first name and it's pending. Then they can say, dear Malusi, for example, dear Tony, for example, in the email to make you feel like this is a personal email and not a, a phishing scam. So we have looked at basic techniques to verify whether an email is a phishing email or not. So when it comes to advanced techniques to tell whether an email is, is a phishing email or not, um, there are several techniques that we can look at. Uh, as we mentioned before, you can expand any shortened links using the two uh, check short URL, I don't know if I can demonstrate that now, uh, maybe not. Uh, yeah, it's not loading. So you can expand any shortened links to see where they're really pointing. It's a really nifty service. You just put your shortened URL and you can expand it and you can see where um, it's pointing to. Secondly, if you have any attachments, you can scan those attachments using virus photo. So I'm going to give you a simple example of how to Scan. So this is virus total, and I'm going to choose a file, a simple file. 
So Verastotal is a service that will check um, the contents of a file against a lot of uh, a lot of antivirus software to see whether there's any um, malware embedded in the in the text itself. As you can see, I have nothing because it was a simple file containing hello hello world. So it will just scan the contents of a file against a bunch of uh, antivirus software. So you might want to run your attachments through the service and see whether or not they have any malware embedded on them. Then you can research on domain names. For example, you have been sent an email by Safaricom asking you to uh, reverse a payment or your account has been suspended or, or something like that. So when you look at the domain or where the from is at, that's the domain name, the, the URL itself. So I'm going to give you an example of, uh, you can use a service who is to check, to check one, when the domain name was registered, two, if the domain name has, to check whether the domain name has been mentioned in a scam, you just Google the domain name and put the word scam at the end. So it could be safaricom.co.ke.uk scam and see what other people are saying about it online. And whether the address is, uh, when looking at domain names, you also want to make sure that the address is linked from the company's main site. So a domain name like safaricom.co.ke can have other domains under it. For example, lempesa.safaricom.co.ke, um, stocks.safaricom.co.ke. So those are subdomain names under the safaricom.co.ke. So you might also want to check whether the sender is part of a subdomain or Safaricom. So we look at an example of uh, Safaricom and see what it tells us. So you can see the name, the server, the URL. So you can see it was registered on uh, in 2003. Wow. Okay. So it was registered on 2003. When checking for the date when it was registered. So if you see that the email that has sent you an the email address that has sent you the phishing, the phishing email, check how early it was registered. If it was registered just prior to when you have received the email, then that, that might be a phishing scam. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we have said, expand any short-term links, scan any attachments on virus total, research on domain names, particularly when they were registered um, finally, check on email headers. So most email programs will just show you a few basic details about you to users about where the email address is from. So it could be from to subject date. Okay. So this information can easily be uh, spoofed by criminals. Okay. But despite this, with a little effort, there's, there's a lot more useful information that you can check about the email address. So email headers are is just textual information that is used by your email server to verify or to validate the email itself. So there's information about the validity of itself, the authentication of the mail server from where it's coming from. And there's more information under it about how uh, the routes of the email, whether there are hops in between and so on and so forth. So key fields to check from your email header. Okay, just one more thing I should mention. If you're using an email provider like Outlook, Gmail, Thunderbird, uh, Roundcube, any email provider, they all have ways in which to check your email headers. The first time you look at email headers, they can be very, very intimidating, but there's a way to pass your email headers into a form that you can understand and see. So a service to pass email headers would be MX Toolbox. I think uh, some of us might know it. It's a service that can allow you to read email headers correctly and you can visualize how the email bounced along the internet where eventually gets to you. So what you might want to check is the masses, uh, the route the email took. So you can see whether there was relaying involved or third parties involved and so on and so forth. You can see email authentication checks. So this is where they check DNS records that verify the authenticity of uh, the source itself. And something in particular, try to look out for is the xmailer header. So if you look at the xmailer header and you see something like gofish, this should immediately tell you that this is a phishing email. 
This is because GoFish is a popular phishing framework tool used by hackers to generate uh, phishing campaigns. Once you see Xmailer and then GoFish, then this should be an immediate telltale sign that this was a, was a phishing email or you are part of a phishing campaign. Okay, so we've seen how to spot an email, a phishing email, and I, and I hope at this point that you can spot one. So how do you prevent phishing attacks? Um, the thing is to exercise caution and practice due diligence. I know most of us receive a bunch of emails in a day and we constantly work on emails. So you might not have time to like look at all those things we've mentioned, look at Gmail headers and look at uh, links and do all these things. But at the end of the day, you only need one person to click an email and you have you might even down an entire network. So always practice constant due diligence. Always check, always verify, always authenticate, always be sure that whatever you're clicking is sure. Whatever you're downloading is something you expected. So all those things we've talked about, always practice constant diligence. And I understand that we all receive a bunch of emails in a day or life can get really hard and don't even have time to constantly be looking at all these things. So, but only just practice a little bit of caution, okay? Because it, it just might just take one person for you to down a whole network. So we've talked about tips and tricks um, in the previous section. So when you see a phishing email, what should you do? Um, what should you not do when you receive a phishing email? So we've talked about all those things. Don't click on links or download attachments. Um, use a URL expander. If there's a need, always just hover over the link to see just basic, basic things that we've talked about. And on top of that, I think this was mentioned in the previous section by, by Linda, I think that was last week, always practice safe password hygiene. Don't reuse passwords. Uh, it's just cyber hygiene throughout the, the scenario. So in case you have been fished, which happens to a lot of us. So I have been fished, what should I do? Phishing happens more often than you think. Um, in fact, one very common phishing technique involves uh, telling IT admin or promising IT admins upgrades to software. That's a very, very common phishing scam and it tends to work a bunch. So if IT admins can, can be fished, what about you know the rest of us? So, so once you've been fished, what, what should you do? So you happened to download an attachment. The curiosity got to you and you downloaded the attachment and you opened it. And suddenly it hits you, oh my goodness, I have been scammed. What's the first thing you need to do? The very, very, very first thing you have to do, disconnect your device from the network. Disconnecting your device from the internet or your network. Number one, will help, it, will help to prevent the cyber criminals from gaining access to important and sensitive data, okay? Also, it might help. Um, it might help that you can't spread the the malware to the network. So that's a really good thing to do. Number one, disconnect your device from the network. Number two, check your computer for viruses. I tell this to everyone. Uh, if you use Microsoft, Microsoft Defender is as good as any antivirus software. I don't think you have to install any other. It's as good as any, and it's also very really powerful. So use Microsoft Defender to check your computer for viruses or malware. Number three, delete the email. Delete the email and attachment immediately. Deleting the email usually won't help, but it's just a good thing to do. But delete the attachment as soon as possible. Okay, that's very obvious. And finally, report the email to your email provider or to your network admin if you have one of those. So reporting the email to your network, to your email provider, for example, Gmail or sorry, Outlook, we help these email providers to identify spam emails in future and make it easier for them to alert other victims, okay? So in case you have open attachments, an attachment in a phishing email, number one, disconnect your device. Number two, check your computer for viruses. Number three, delete the email and any attachments that came with it. And number four, report that email to you, to your email provider. I know it's a very panicky situation, but once you take these steps, you might be able to handle the situation. What if you clicked on a phishing link, okay? Just like before, the very first thing you need to do is to disconnect your device from 
the internet. As, as I mentioned, it will reduce the risk of malware spreading to other devices on your network. And it will also prevent attackers from connecting to your device because they connect through the internet. Um, yeah, so first of all, disconnect your device from the internet. If you're using Wi-Fi, shut down Wi-Fi. If you're using LAN, remove the internet cable from, from your PC or from your laptop. Number two, check if you've downloaded an attachment. So this is in the scenario of exploit phishing. So sometimes uh, an email will ask you to click on a link, which will then remotely download a file. So check your download folder if you've downloaded an attachment. If you have, of course, go ahead and delete it. Then number three, back up your files because sometimes recovering from a phishing attack can, can damage your file system, for example. And then number four, just as in the previous section, run a virus scan with using whichever antivirus software you use. But if you don't have any and you use Windows, Microsoft Defender is as good as any. So perform a thorough, thorough, thorough scan. So this is after you've disconnected your device from the internet. Also, I should mention, it's also a good idea to run the scan a few days after, after you clicked on the link. Because this, this, if the virus is new, if the, if the malware was newly created, it may take a few days before antivirus malware, antivirus softwares have a signature for, for this particular virus. So what if you give away any personal information? So if you give away any credit card information or bank account information, the first thing you might want to do is inform your bank immediately. So inform your bank immediately in case you give out personal banking information. Number two, change your password. Get into the habits of changing your password frequently, using strong passwords. In general, just using a password manager. Password managers have saved my life a lot of times. Use a password manager. Number three, delete any unrecognized devices. So I'm sure once you have tried to log into Gmail from another device, uh, it usually tells you someone has, just abruptly, someone has tried to log in. Please be careful if it's not you, tell us so that we can get you out of there immediately. So there are services such as Facebook or Google that are able to know which devices have logged in and they can keep an account of all the devices that have logged into your account. So if you see any unrecognized devices, delete them and report them, okay? So that's a thing you might want to do if you clicked on a phishing link and the attackers were able to steal your, your credentials and they were able to log into your devices, for example, into your into your services or into your into your accounts, yeah. So finally, um, your credentials have been stolen and your account has been hacked. What you might want to do, if your account is an email or social media account, you might want to inform your friends and your contacts that you might have been hacked in case hackers use it to, to send spam to other people. So that's a good thing to do, just to be cautious about it. Inform your friends, your contacts, even your colleagues that you might have been hacked and they should be aware of any scams that appear to come from you. So uh, that brings us to the end. So we, so far we have looked at um, existing threats, phishing, what exactly phishing is, motivation for fishers. We have looked at how to spot one, how to mitigate. Oh, I should probably mention that a lot of email providers and productivity suits like, um, like Microsoft, Microsoft Office or G Suite, they all have technological techniques to sort of, um, they have spam filters, malware filters. They have a lot of email protection techniques available, but it is also important for all of us because hackers know that they do have these protections in place and they try to evade them. So the very last stop is us. So how do we fight the fish, yeah? So that brings us to the end of our session. So we have looked at all the techniques. We have looked at how to be safe on the internet, especially via email. So I'm going to leave you with a very, with a phishing quiz that I really like. So just to practice or to, to know how to spot one effectively, I really like this phishing quiz from Google because it's also kind of tough. It, it's only eight questions. So where do I put this? I've put it in the chat. If you ever want to do, I'd really encourage you to, I really encourage you to check it out. Do it, see how you score, 
the very first time I think I scored like a six. So six out of eight, it's a very tough uh, fishing quiz. So I'd encourage you all of you to, to try it out, see how you perform. Um, you can always reach out to me via Twitter, mostly on Twitter, at the Sneezy Ladybug. You can always reach out to me, tell me how your experience was with the fishing activity, and we can talk more about it. So if you are at all in learning more about uh, tomorrow I'm holding a session at Hackfest, which is where we go in depth to the tech side of fishing. We're going to see how to uh, execute fishing campaigns that work, uh, why exactly fishing is successful. And we're going to talk a lot more, but it's going to be uh, sort of kind of technical. So if this is something you're interested in to know how attackers actually execute fishing campaigns and what works and what doesn't, you might want to join me tomorrow at she Hacks at 8 p.m. So I'd encourage all of you, if you want to join, I'd be more than happy to have you. If you have any questions, I'm available on Twitter, as I've mentioned. And if there's any questions right now, I can answer them. Uh, OK. Yes, uh, the slides will be shared, I believe. She can answer that to us. She will the slide be shared. Hello. Hi, Malusi. Yes, the slides can be shared via mail, but they are, okay. um, this um, Zoom meeting is also on YouTube, so one can go oh, through okay. them. Okay. okay, so I think that brings us to the end of the session, unless there's anything I, sh I haven't mentioned, she, or if there's anything uh, you want to say. I think this brings us to the end of the session. Thank you so much for having me. I had a good time getting the questions. What myths are there around fishing? What myths are there around fishing? Let me think. Uh, I think the things that I've experienced in my career about fishing is that people think that it's the dumbest people who fall for fishing scams. Everyone, honestly, anyone can fall for a fishing scam because um, I have seen really, really, really well done and really good phishing uh, emails that are very well executed. And some won't even tell you to download anything or click on a link. Some will have the malware itself embedded on a logo, like some really, really good stuff people are doing out there. So this is something I, I don't want to talk about tomorrow in case you want to join the session. But phishing is changing. And regardless of how much user awareness there is, phishing will always be a technique that attackers will use. So it's always a thing about chasing the next, you know, sort of knowledge that we always can get about it. How best can we inform our users about um, phishing scams? What is the latest thing about phishing scams? And something that, that users think is attackers will just have wrong spelling or all these things, but attackers are also really, really smart individuals. So it's almost, always a game of uh, chasing. It's like a Tom and Jerry game. We always keep chasing each other. So I don't know if there's any other myths around fishing, but I, I, the thing I believe is, or the thing I see a lot is that people think it's the dumbest people who fall for fishing. If there are fishing techniques that, that aim or that target IT admins, best believe that fishing can affect anyone. So yeah, I think that's, that answers that. Or if I've not answered, we can talk more on, on Twitter. So, she, uh, back to you. But just to say thank you so much for having me. This was a wonderful session. Um, yeah, have a good cyber awareness week, everyone. Month, sorry. She, back to you. Thank you so much, Malusi. I don't know if there are any questions. If there are none. Um, I have a few announcements. Um, next week, we're going to be covering the um, B cybersecurity first. And this just means that uh, we are trying to make security a priority, whether we are um, onboarding staff or even purchasing those um, gadgets that we are using, whether it's the phones or the routers in our houses and so on and so forth. And then on the last week of this month, we are going to have the Cyber Security Career Awareness Week, 
that is going to be something to definitely look out for. We have sessions around mental health and just um, careers in cybersecurity. Other than that, um, I find it noteworthy to note that some of our partners are also having events uh, during this Cybersecurity Awareness Month, that is. We have she hacks every Thursday from 7 p.m. You can catch them there. Um, we also have events that are coming up um, from Cyber in Africa. Um, we are looking to do a collaboration there and also Africa Hackon, which is scheduled for the fifth of, of next month, sorry. So be on the lookout for those events um, if that is something that interests you and you're definitely going to make the most out of this awesome month. Before we leave, um, I have a quote. Culture, it's strategy for breakfast. So what culture do you have in your family or in your organization? I repeat that, culture, it's strategy for breakfast. So what culture do you have in your family or in your organization? Thank you so much for everyone who's been here. Um, hope to see you next week. Have a good weekend ahead. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.